So uh, this is an informal conversation about very important uh, formal matters. So, um, so anyway, there was this little known group, a uh, little known in history, called the Education Leaders Council. Um, and this is its story largely, and I wanted to have a conversation with my two friends and colleagues um, to help kind of set the stage about what was happening when they were state school chiefs um, and how their worlds evolved then, uh, now, and, uh, and, and with some real sort of storied history there. Let me just begin by telling you a couple of very small personal stories. Um, Lisa and I have a <laughs> really personal. So I'm going to start with Lisa because she's slightly more recent in my life than Jean Hickok, although not much more recent. And uh, our history goes back to uh, the early 90s, actually before the Center for Education Reform was founded. Um, and I was working as a policy analyst at the Heritage Foundation. And um, she was a state legislator, and she and I were communicating. In fact, she was one of the many people I'd met around the country that made me decide that I needed to go and do something um, with mainstream folks without an ideology on my back and actually get out in the states and the communities where people were doing real things. And Lisa and I both had small children at the time, and we used to talk on the phone in our bathrobes. And I'll remember that because she actually shared personally with me that she was wearing a bathrobe one day. <laughs> and I said, well, interestingly enough, it's only 6 o'clock there, it's 8 a.m. here, I just got the kids out of the house, and I'm in my bathrobe too. And we were talking about the state of education, how ridiculous things were going at such a slow pace in history in Arizona. And she later ran for state superintendent of public instruction and won. And I'm going to pause that story right there and then go to Jean Hickok. Jean Hickok uh, was the secretary of education in Pennsylvania under Governor Tom Ridge during the point in time when they created the charter law, as many of you might have heard Dwight Evans say. But I also knew Jean in a prior life before Lisa, because when I was a political science major and student at Dickinson College, I decided to take a course from Dr. Hickok. And Professor Hickok was like my Mr. Chips. I hope that's not a dirty movie. I haven't seen it in a really long time, only younger. I actually thought he was really, <laughs> I actually thought he was really old at the time, but later I found out he was maybe four years older than I was. Um, I'm flattering you, Gene. And, and so after I left, he actually ran for school board. He was on the school board. And, and I would correspond, not infrequently. And then eventually Tom Ridge gets elected governor. And we start hearing he's looking for an education secretary. And then we hear through the grapevine, there's this guy named Gene Hickok on the short list. And so a bunch of us at like our level started like, oh, wow, we should write letters and say Gene Hickok would be the greatest person in the world. And I remember years later actually meeting Tom Ridge and him saying to me, oh, my gosh, like people were coming out of the woodwork saying Gene Hickok was an amazing guy. And I'm like, yeah, we, we, we helped do that. Not that he wouldn't have gotten the job on his own. Gene becomes secretary, Lisa runs and becomes elected state chief of Arizona. And literally within about a week, they call each other, and they call me, and they go, oh my gosh, WTF, we are chief state school officers, and we are getting inundated with information from the traditional organizations. So Lisa, I'm going to take, have you take it off from there and tell what happened. Well, um, we probably didn't use the initials WTF, I'll just tell you that. Um, I, I, I think I was amazed, uh, to be really specific about this, we got over our fax, those of you who are old enough will remember we used to have fax machines, and in came this message um, exhorting me to immediately go to my legislators and ask for more money for whatever it was, federal money for something, um, and I called the... Uh, this was this in particular. This one came from the Council of Chief State School Officers, and at that time, and I have to say, there's been a transformation. At that time, however, they were pretty much just about money, and I, I said, I, you know, I kind of feel like I just got elected to not just fall in line here. We're going to do some accountability, some choice. We're working on a charter school implementation that we just passed, and there was nothing at the organization that could support us in that. As a matter of fact, they're fairly antithetical to it, so. I just told them that we wouldn't be paying our dues anymore. And um, well, you know, the public's money, and I felt like, well, you know, we needed to implement what the public had just passed. And so uh, I called Jean and said, I'm going to do that. And Jean, fortunately, um, brought the governor to 
to the National Governors Association Conference in Burling, get Burlington, Vermont. So there you go. There's your cue. It was quick. Yeah. 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 I had the very same experience. Uh, I uh, didn't know what I was getting into when the governor asked me to be Secretary of Education. I thought it would be about education. Uh, <laughs> and as, as Dwight pointed out earlier, in, in Pennsylvania it's about a whole lot of things besides education. And I got the same facts from CCSSO, and I didn't understand the words because it was all a bunch of jargon. And I'm a political scientist, I'm not an education expert. Um, and so for me, I couldn't make sense of what they were talking about. But before I went to Vermont, I went to their regional meeting. And I sat there for two days and literally could not understand what was being said. I knew they were hostile because I asked questions because I didn't know. Uh, so when I got to Vermont, to be around real people who talked about real issues in a language I could understand as opposed to jargon was a breath of fresh air. And the dues at that time were pretty high for CCSSO. And uh, 50,000? 50, 50, 50, and so we decided the same thing, we're not going to join. It wasn't really a political statement. I was looking for help. I was looking for someone who could help me because <laughs> I was brand new to this business and um, that's where I found the help. So we're sitting in Burlington, Vermont. Now, as you have to understand, the National Governors Association really doesn't let just anybody in. We weren't really attending, but because Gene worked for Governor Ridge, we kind of piggybacked on whatever was happening. And a bunch of people came to Burlington, Vermont for the founding meeting, right? We were sort of like the, 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 the proverbial, it's like Founders Hall. So who was there? We had Frank Brogan, Frank Brogan in Florida, Will Bryant in Virginia, um, and I'm sorry. Remember, we're very old. Uh, we, we don't remember things too remember well. these guys. There was a second woman in Virginia as well. So they have a two-tier, they had two commissioners. Beverly, but they had Linda Beverly. Scrow, right? Was Beverly that Scrow. The, yeah, Beverly Scrow. Um, yeah, Linda, Linda Schranko, Schranko in Georgia. Georgia. Um, who else? John Root, New Hampshire, State Board. Oh, yeah. Right? That's right. Yeah. And um, was there someone from Texas at the time? Not uh, yet. Well, Jim Nelson also ultimately came on, but I think right. a little later. And yeah. Checker Finn was at the initial meeting, Checker right? Was there. To help yep. advise. Yep. Yep. And, and so. And you. And I, I was there. And so they decided to start a new organization. So not only did you not pay your dues to that, they questioned just about every education establishment organization. I think the Education Commission of the States, again, back then, not exactly a leader in anything having to do with reform. I have to say today, I believe I would have stayed in those organizations because the dialogue is about a lot, I mean, uh, forcibly about choices. Right, about, but why is it? Uh, bec it is now because we left then. <laughs> I think, I think it just, we were part of a larger movement and it wasn't a statement as Jean said, we wanted colleagues who could help us understand what we were doing and more importantly, we wanted colleagues who could criticize what we were doing. When you are the only voice on a panel of people who say it's all one way and then you know, you're the oppositional force, you get so used to being shot at, you don't know when the bullets are deserved. Sometimes you're just flat out wrong, but you can't say that out loud because there's no safe space to do that in. And a lot of what we were doing was new. We didn't know. We, need to, we needed to know when things had gone badly and we needed a safe space to talk about that in. Um, so I, I'll be forever grateful. It was, a, it was great to have those colleagues in that moment. Well, someone mentioned in an earlier panel the importance of sort of developing support networks, support groups, uh, because these conversations too often take place in isolation. Not as much as they used to for a lot of good reasons, but in those days, late 90s, uh, the, the fact is ELC was an opportunity for us to find out what we had in common, our different policies and politics, um, the kinds of problems we confronted, the kinds of challenges we confronted, and you began to realize you're not alone. And also gave us a chance, at least in Pennsylvania, to bring some other people from outside of Pennsylvania, like Jeannie, to come to talk to some of our legislators about charter schools. Because politicians are people, and they're elected to public office, and they, they need to have a level of comfort around controversial issues. It's very understandable. Um, and once they saw that charter schools were taking place here, and tax credits were taking place here, and they could talk to other legislators from other states about those issues, they began to develop a level of comfort too. And that's how you get things done. And the, 
Jeannie, the politics were so different in Arizona. So when we passed public charter school law in 94, it was part of a big overhaul. And at the bill actually started with a voucher piece in it, a pilot voucher piece. But we had Democrats um, in the Senate in control, Republicans in the House. At that time, I was a Republican. At this time, I have no party. But, but then um, the Democrats in the Senate were being governed on the education front by the Latino community. This was pushed by the Hispanic Community Forum, um, Chicanos por la Causa, Guy, um, Linda Aguirre, Armando Reese, um, some of you know Tommy Espinosa. So for me, I as a young legislator, I didn't understand when I started working nationally that this was, reform was seen as a Republican thing. Uh, Okay, fine, that, that's good, but that's not what happened in Arizona. I love when Ms. Courtney said earlier there's a lot of revisionist history about what happened when. Uh, no, that's not, I mean, we, we, it was, I was a Republican and I was proud of that, proud of that um, party movement for educational reform, but that's not how it happened in Arizona. So it was really fascinating to me to get out there into the country and understand we had to tell the story of these alliances and how important they were from the get-go. Um, so it was a great opportunity to do that. Well, and so you just touched on something I wanted to raise, which is at that time as well, again, not more than barely 20 years ago, right? Um, this is more like about 17. You had governors who were supportive and who crossed party aisles and did it in really interesting ways, right? So, Gene, you had not only superintendents were, I remember, kind of shooting, you know, shooting at you from the back, front, and every which way, thinking that you were just going to be a short timer and just wait because the governor's going to hear from them, and it just bolstered him. Um, yeah. So tell a little bit about what that was like and then what he had to do to make change. Uh, governor Ridge um, was passionate about education. I was very fortunate. One, that he chose me, and secondly, that I got a chance to work with him. He really believed in the importance of shaking the system. Uh, he had a very, very large agenda. That's one reason he had a hard time finding a secretary of education. No one wanted to do the work. I didn't know better. Uh, <laughs> I'll never forget the day I got the job. I walk into the office, I look around, and I say, what have I done? Because I had no idea what was coming. But Ridge uh, had a very tough agenda, which he pursued doggedly. He didn't get it twice, and so then we decided to break apart the various components of the agenda and go after each one of them separately. And we got almost all of them except for school choice, but we did get tax credits. Um, and I think it's because he also recognized that this is a human story. This isn't just about dollars. It's not just about regulations. It's not just about systems. It's about people. And the people in the largest city in the state were being sacrificed. Some argue they still are by a system which was completely dysfunctional and very expensive. And the same thing went for a city on the other side of the state and for the capital of Harrisburg. And so what we did, what he did, what I tried to do was paint that picture. Uh, I tried to make sure politicians, elected officials came with me to see these students, not just visit the Blue Ribbon schools, that's a piece of cake. Visit the schools that have you know, barbed wire outside and padlocks so nobody can come in or get out. That'll sober you up. And that's something that Tom Ridge made sure happened, and that's how we got things done. And, and what you two did is you went and you collected other superintendents, state board members, started having conferences, invited the governors who came to the conferences. And um, we've been talking a lot about that lately, at least at CER and whoever will listen, about how we have a lot of good governors today, but they were mavericks. And, and I guess I've got a, you know, a slightly pointed question to ask you, believe it or not. Um, what is the difference? I mean, there are a lot of people who, who really believe that we've arrived. Things are happening, it's great. You didn't have charters, you did the first standards in Arizona. I'll never forget going to Arizona and sitting in a meeting and Lisa had teachers and parents and superintendents assemble and she stood up and said, we're gonna do statewide standards. And you know, folks, if you think the Tea Party's a problem, maybe some of you don't, I don't necessarily always do. You should have seen these people. They're like, you're gonna do standards? We didn't like you do standards. What are you talking about? There, there were standards in Arizona and Pennsylvania then. They, they, they waged charter efforts, um, tax credits, changing how money flows in the system. And these maverick governors got up at every single turn to talk about it. I see slight differences today. It is a bigger movement, but I don't see nearly as much teeth as that. Why is that? Well, people are policy. 
Right. And, and there are some wonderful leaders out there in the country. There's, there's no question in my mind. So I, I, I think, Jeannie, um, you know, I listen to the Common Core discussion right now, and I think um, my mother gave me a placard once that said, experience is recognizing a mistake when you make it again. Um, and so this discussion that we're going through on the Common Core and, you know, whether it is possible to sort of define a set of things that we absolutely need to get to, and I realize there's probably much very disparate view in this room, but the discussion and the opposition, and I was at Ed Nation at, um, this week listening to people say, we just, this is just going so fast. This is just way too fast. There's Tony uh, Bennett, I know has experienced the same thing. What you get is just pushback. And from any particular uh, idea, it is too fast. It's, you know, that we're not ready. Instead of the conversation over what is happening for children. Um, and I, I don't know if now governors, Jeannie, feel like after 20 years, this is not an issue they want to take up because it's so rough. And I, I have to say, I think par in part because we do not work together. And I think that Governor Ridge, who is so fabulous, um, Governor Symington in Arizona that, that we worked with, a lot of governors around the country were not getting these things done without bipartisan coalitions. You go back and check that. None of this happened forced by one party. And when that can't happen anymore and you're just standing up and trying to decide how to get one over on somebody, then, then you don't take this up as your issue because education reform happens at the midline. It just does. Yeah, a couple of things. One, uh, first of all, we, we talk it to death. Not just we, the issue is talked to death. And it wears people down. Um, it wears elected officials down. It wears public school officials down. It wears reformers down. So it takes a certain high level of energy and personal commitment that missionary zeal someone mentioned earlier. Secondly, the conversation really, it hasn't changed all that much. It was brand new when we were there, charter schools. And thank goodness they're more of a part, I think they're a permanent part of American education. But, you know, it seems to me that we need to be willing to sort of, I guess, I guess have a leap of the imagination and start thinking of other things. I argue, for example, we continue to confuse schooling with education, right? All we talk about really is schooling reform, which is good, but we live in an age where we can really rethink the whole idea of education. We really can. And, and charters was a first conversation about doing that, but I'd love to see people start that second conversation. And it's not gonna come from elected officials, governors, because that's not why they're there. It's gonna come from you, and it's gonna come from uh, your constituents, and it has to be sort of a grassroots eruption that takes place. Then they'll listen because they have to, and that's just human nature. And at the center of that conversation, you've both referred to this a number of times already, was the notion that parents should have some choices, parents should have power. And you were getting faxed in the early days and called by groups that were saying, it's about growing the, the largesse at certain levels of government. Remember, Lisa, you said you walked in to the Department of Education and you knew where the federal programs were because it's where the nice carpets were? Yeah. No, that was true. I mean, you could go down the hall and you could tell who had money and who didn't. And if you were a state program, you didn't. And you didn't have new furniture and everything. But um, so, yeah, no, no, you can tell the difference. So how do, we, how do we transition the conversation in the country back to education, back to education where parents are sort of at the center? You know, a few minutes ago, said we're going to talk a little bit about a poll that we just released, and our pollster's going to be up here. But it seems to me one of the other things that maybe we've talked to death or over-talked, and people actually think it's happening writ large, is that we already have choices. You know, Jeannie, one of the most important things CER has always done is talk about grassroots and things that happen um, organically. And I have to say that I am wildly optimistic about what's going on, and I, I think, as always, change comes from the activists on the ground. So when you make a choice, you are making a choice to go to a school that a teacher is leading. That, so this, this movement is actually about getting the profession freed to do their work. So I look around this room, and I see the most amazing school leaders who did not exist 20 years ago, who used the opportunity to, to go a different route. And I think that the parent organization movement, um, parent organizing, public charter schools in the main has brought this because it, it's, it's systematized, but also 
choice across the board. The individuals who are doing that work, I think are, well, I don't just think. I mean, there's so much more dispersed at this point, and things are happening all over the place. You know, we, I work on National School Choice Week, which is we have 140 events and 406. This year, 3,600. Three, Next year, 5,000. And this year, all sorts of school districts going, no, we're in. We get it, right? We're a choice. <laughs> Give us the yellow scarf. We will party with you. <laughs> we're on. So I, I mean, I just see, I see the change very organically. I believe that that's where it is and that that will push governors and leadership folks to take it up again on behalf of the folks who are doing the work. I just, it's quantifiably different now. There was lots of talk at the top 20 years ago. There was lots of action at the bottom 20 years later. Yeah, yeah there's, there's definitely been a, a shift in the culture. Um, and that's what needs to take place. Education, as you all know, has its own culture. Post-secondary education has its own culture. Both sectors are undergoing some perhaps revolutionary potential change. Uh, and it's being driven primarily by this culture shift. People are beginning to realize, if you look at post-secondary, that something's up. And at the K-12 level, they're doing the same thing. So there's reason to be optimistic, but I think what we need to do is really uh, fuel that grassroots, almost anger, frankly. Um, you know, I used to make the argument that if the parents in Philadelphia schools would get organized, I'll help them get organized, and decided one day they're just not going to accept it anymore. There's nothing you can do about that. No governor's going to say you must send your child to school to 100 frustrated parents because the schools don't work. That's grassroots. I think there's a greater possibility of that kind of energy than ever before. But we need to be pursuing it, and we need to be supportive of it where we see it. So it was our shared quest to make education reform mainstream, to make it cool. And you created. We were not cool. We, by the way. we weren't cool that way. No, we were not. And again, we look do, at the shoes. We wouldn't have done this with shoes <laughs> right, 20 years ago. That's the, again, we should probably do that. Um, and uh, so, so that was our shared quest. And then ELC eventually grew to some uh, 25 state chiefs, state board members, and key other state leaders. Um, no Child Left Behind gets passed. Dare I, dare I bring that into the conversation? NCLB. Lisa, you follow it with ELC to DC to help now fuel a movement of accountability and consequences for action. Gene, you become first uh, undersecretary, then deputy secretary. Um, in an administration age when people really understood that if money follows kids, then accountability has to follow money, right? And yet now we're in an environment where people go, oh my gosh, that NCLB, this is awful, and this is on the cusp of another new national standards effort coming. What is happening with this, and could you please bring some truth to power about what NCLB was intended to be and why you embraced it? It was all my fault. <laughs> uh, You're George Bush, <laughs> really. <laughs> it really was, uh, if, you, if you look at the law, as originally passed and originally implemented, it was a rather extraordinary thing. First of all, I guess it was the last bipartisan thing to pass Congress. Uh, I think it probably is, uh, frankly. Uh, anytime you can get the more liberal and more conservative members of Congress together, that says something. Uh, it speaks again to Dwight Evans' comments about Pennsylvania. Um, it was all about trying to change the conversation from more money to more results. And that may sound straightforward now, but that was a revolutionary change at the federal level. Um, and it was not a welcome change, and it's still not a welcome change. And there are many flaws with the law, but the goal here really was that simple. Don't we need to focus on how well students are doing? Don't we need to focus on whether or not teachers know what they're teaching? Don't we need to figure out how much bang we get for the buck as opposed to how many bucks we spend? That was all behind No Child Left Behind. Um, and I think, I think it did help to change the conversation. I still think, I think I can say this, we spend too much time looking at this city and education reform when most of the dollars by far and most of the reform by far takes place in cities all across the country. And that's why ELC was so important at the time because people from the states and the localities we're starting a national conversation about the importance of what's taking place at the local level, at the state level. And ELC helped to fuel that as well, even though it's a more of a national effort. One last thing, uh, President Bush gets almost no credit for this, but this is a Republican president 
embracing education reform, which at the time was a very democratic policy, right? Embracing a law which he said would take 14 years to be fully implemented long after he leaves office, and which, by the way, would benefit primarily non-Republican constituents, low-income minority students. Uh, that was a principled call on his part, and I don't think he gets enough credit for that. Maybe the flaws are there, but I think he deserves a lot of credit. And those are the same students and families that education reform has been dedicated to from day one. They need a voice, and our goal has always been to try to help them find their voice as much as we can. So Lisa, do we lose the consequences for behavior? Is that where, is that where we've gone full circle? Where, where no one really wants to talk about um, those fail-safe consequences, if you're in a failing school, you get to leave. You get to get tutored. You get to get out. And those choices that we were creating at the state level were supposed to help, cre help, help catch them, right? Where is that? Um, well, I, I think it's the choice or the consequence is going to be in the option. The, the consequence is going to be you, you have a lot more opportunity to make a different choice. So we just had the opportunity to be sitting with um, Sekou Biddle at um, UNCF this morning talking about, when we were talking about DC's, basically their, their system by which you choose your school now. Like, so, so you basically, you get up on a website and you look at it and your options are listed and yeah, you have priority into um, you know, your proximate schools, but the listing of what's available to you, and then you can hit something and go see what the quality is, just on the letter grade, if, you know, if that's not what you want to look for, you should be going to the school anyway. That is, a, that is hugely different than 20 years ago. The, the presumption is just you just go to this school. So the consequence to me, I mean, I'm a marketplace kind of gal because I think that really what we ought to be looking at is what is it that parents are looking for, so you need to be giving them those options. They will make a decision for different reasons, but we have got to be completely transparent about the quality of those schools, which is why testing and assessment and why the whole aspiration of No Child Left Behind is really important. Um, I, I think to get back to that for a second, at the time, if you remember in the early 90s when we were coming out with our state tests, almost all of us were being sued. We were almost all in the courts fighting organizations like Fair Test and others who were, who were trying to sue a, our tests out from under us. And it actually was No Child Left Behind that said you will have an assessment and all of those lawsuits got killed. And people don't give that very much credit, but I have to, you know, I had that conversation with Senator Ted Kennedy. This was not familiar ground for the senator. It was his folks who didn't want the assessment, right? So, I mean, it feels like glory days now when as a Republican, you know, I had worked for John McCain. He would walk into Ted Kennedy's office to discuss what he needs to make it safe for him to do this. And we had that conversation. And I didn't feel bad about it, and neither did he. Um, and and, and it's a, maybe that's a small thing, but I felt like it, it, the aspiration of that law pushed us very, very far. It, of course, as it rolls out, you know, it's been problematic in a lot of ways, but I, I remember being sued, and I remember not being able to test kids, so it, it matters to me. And, and if you were a state chief today, would you take a waiver? And if, and if so, why or why not? Maybe I should switch shoes with you. <laughs> we were not allowed to issue waivers. Uh, the White House said point blank, we're not going to issue waivers. Because up until that law was the law of the land, uh, a majority of the states were not compliant with federal education law, ever. <laughs> so we made a principal decision. We have to be hard-nosed about this. Um, what I worry about with the waivers, what I worry about with all of this talk is how transparent are we really? You know, in almost every state, we see efforts to change the standards, change the cut scores, get a better grade. Every governor wants to have good schools, so every governor has to find a way to say, I have good schools. Um, and that's a problem. Transparency forces people to confront the truth. And that's a very difficult thing for people to do when the truth is ugly. And they're responsible for it. So for me, um, I'm not interested in waivers. What I'm interested in is, you know, if I could go back and have a Governor Ridge who was willing to confront the truth, um, that's what needs to happen. Uh, and I don't think that's happening in too many places, sadly. So we're making promises now instead of having to prove that we know how to spend money. 
right? That's sort of the, that's the, is that the basis for well, today's I mean, policy? It, it, the, the basis for today's policy is if you will do this, we'll give you a waiver and we'll trust that you will do this. And down the road, you would become somebody else, a different governor, a different state chief, and we'll have another conversation about other waivers and other ways of doing things. There's no bottom line. It's all, it's all about bargaining. And if there's anything we need in American education, it's a bottom line, an educational bottom line that everyone can see and everyone cannot ignore or cover up. That's still a problem for us, I think, as a country. So I think the biggest shift for us will be the profession itself standing up and gradually saying, look, this is the high bar we all want to attain. And it's not a one-size-fits-all thing, and it's not, you know, the common core of standards, which were voluntarily developed uh, by hundreds of educators. And I'm not, I, I never felt like that was going to be the thing that was going to save the world. But I do think it'd be nice, you know, to have comparability of an educational standard, whether you want to join the Common Core Coalition or not, but as a profession to say, you know what? Algebra 2 is a gateway into college and to success in college. So those skills, you got to master at a particular age. So all I want are high scores and I want comparability that, that keeps the politics of Arizona for example, when we put out the Ames test in Arizona, 11% of our high school kids could pass the math portion. Today, that number is 97% before they let you add on. I have bad news for you. We have not moved on other examinations like you know national exams. So our kids didn't get that much better. We just put the bar on the ground, and then we buried it slightly underneath the ground. So that doesn't help. Families, meanwhile, we're lying to them. We give them a piece of paper that says, your child is ready for college. No, she is not. And so it's just dishonest. So I do think having the opportunity to select one of a number of assessments that are state comparable with high achievement, I just think as long as you're a little bit in the marketplace, right, you don't have the one thing that can get killed, I just think that's progress. I do. And so, you know, I'm a fan because I still think <laughs> it, you, can, you can poke at it and you can say, well, there's a book we don't like. First of all, what teacher or school doesn't read a book before they assign it? I just really want to know. But anyway, so, I, I mean, you can, you can get angry about all of this, but at the end of the day, do you know what your kids are shooting at and do your parents know how well your kids are doing? You know, as I want to start broadening the conversation. And Kellyanne, if you can start coming up here, I want to, I want to make a comment. Um, we're going to bring up Kellyanne Conway uh, from the polling company, who just conducted a poll recently, covered a lot of these issues and more, from politics to issues to state, to state government. And Kellyanne's going to talk to us a little bit. We're going to reflect. But Gene and Lisa, I want to tell you this quick story. You talk about standards and cutoff scores. I was uh, a couple of years ago, not even, at the state legislature in Pennsylvania talking about what else, the five-year effort to get multiple authorizers there. Please, Representative Evans, save me, I say publicly. Um, and I made a comment about the standards in the test, and I made a comment about the cut scores. And literally, the vice chairman of the committee goes, wait, 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 what did you just say? And I said, well, what do you mean about the cut scores? He said, yeah. And he said, did you just say we lowered standards? I said, well, yeah, you, you have, actually, every year for the last five years. He said, well, who does that? What's, what's cut score? It's the state legislature, right? I mean, this is no surprise to you. But state legislature, so literally, I got done with my spiel, and I leave, and they ha the next person comes up, and he corners me, and he says, do you have any information you can send me about that? You know, where is that coming from? You both were state superintendents. You both were running states. You both were incredibly influential at the national level. Tell us, boil it down for America watching, and this will be on our website for in perpetuity. Where, who, who's sitting there low in the cut scores, and how are they doing it? Do they have like a little piece of paper, and they go, oh, six questions now on 10 will now be an A. I mean, wh who does this stuff? And how do we get it so people know it's accessible? Because this will be, by the way, lovers of Common Core or not, this will be the next battle we fight on tests. Go ahead. So we're adorable. <laughs> I'll go ahead. Pogo, you go ahead. we've met the enemy and it's us. Who does it? We all do it. We all do it. When parents go and they say, at the most, one of the richest high schools in Arizona, I stood up to talk about standards and assessment, the school principal of that school stood up and said, I couldn't pass these math standards, and he got applauded. And that was one of the worst days of my professional career, right? 
So the worst problem in Arizona is a low cultural expectation, and that is true for a whole bunch of reasons. We don't have a lot of universities in Arizona. I suspect that wouldn't happen necessarily in Massachusetts, next to Harvard, in the Harvard's neighborhood or whatever, but it happens in Arizona. Well, and it happens all over the country. When my child doesn't graduate and you're telling me that I've done a poor job, that's who does it. At the end of the day, the organization that does it is usually the State Board of Education, and they do that in collaboration with the state test or the testing companies um, who advise them to use things like make your scores start at 500. You get this advice, by the way. Start your scores at 500 so that nobody knows what 876 means, right? You want to make sure, and really, can I just testing companies, God bless, but they're all using the same questions. It's just, we all, they gave us all the same questions, but we, they charged us two million books to put our map on the front page of the test that they were actually given in Pennsylvania. The standards have just not been that different. It's just been a matter of whether we were willing to keep our standard at a high level and resist the political pushback from us, the public, 75% um, of the public wants these standards and assessments, but when it hits the fan, that 25% activates. They stand in your living room every night on the television, um, and they say, we don't want this, and everybody caves. Jim? Yeah, I really don't have much to add to that. As I said earlier, we need to have an academic bottom line, and we have to live by it, and we just don't want to do that. And so we change the, the roadmap to look better, and we all do it. We all do it. We don't want our kids to feel bad. We don't want to have too many tests. It's, 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 it's really very sad. And um, it's not going to change unless individuals have the political will to stand firm. And that takes a whole lot of political will. It takes a lot for a parent. It takes a lot for a school board member, for a superintendent. Uh, there's a lot. And that's what we need. Let me, let me just, the second worst moment, or maybe the first worst moment of my political career, when this was all going on, Arizona got sued by the Arizona Republic newspaper, and they said they were suing us because I wouldn't release the test questions so that everybody could see them. <laughs> and I had to explain to them that that ruins the test here. You can't, actually cannot have the test in circulation and give it. But that was news to everybody, so they sued us at the department. Under the guise of transparency, and, and you could, anybody can come into the department and sign a non-disclosure. You can look at the test, of course, but they didn't, that wasn't enough. So they bring in Jean Glass from Arizona State University, and Jean, you remember this. And they asked Jean, what should a child have to prove that they can do algebra to get out of high school? And Jean says, no. Should they have to prove that they could read, say, the state's largest newspaper, who it, for whom you are a witness? to get out of high school? No. And the question was, what should a child have to know to graduate? And this is the honest to God answer from the number two person at that time from the College of Ed at ASU, which has transformed radically now, thank God, that's another great thing. Jean Glass says, students need to know their Miranda rights. You, you, wanna, you wanna find a less hopeful view for humanity? I mean, and, and I, um, I, I don't even know, I do know what that means. Um, but when that is coming from the leadership, I spent the next couple of months going around to business organizations asking them to unfund ASU's College of Ed. Oh, I did. That. That's just foul way to think. And thankfully they blow it up. They did blow it up. Not because of me probably, but they did blow it up. Michael Crow. Okay, Kellyanne Conway, come on up. And for those of you who are joining us out in TV land, I've always wanted to be Oprah. This is awesome. You should all come up here and try this. Get the mic, look in the camera. If you're just joining us now, this is the Center for Education Reform at 20. Lisa Keegan, Jean Hickok, Kellyanne Conway, also with fabulous shoes. Tune in, turn on. Kellyanne, thank you. This is actually a great segue for you because it turns out people like rigor, don't they? Here we go. Here, I've got one for you. People do like rigor. Fascinating result. They love joyful rigor. They love yes, joyful they rigor. They do. Uh, thank you very much, Jeannie. I would love to publicly thank and commemorate and celebrate the 20th anniversary of the Center for Education Reform. You know, here in Washington, we wish certain people would go for term limits, and we're, and then there are people like Jeannie who stay in the same job for 20 years, and we're actually happy about that. So, way to go. Um, 20 years with no shutdown. Very, very well done. We have uh, partnered up with Center for Education Reform a number of times over the years in different states and nationwide with focus groups and polling, really just to uh, try to understand, <clears throat> excuse me, what people think about education reform, but also what they know about it. 
I think too often public opinion polling just presumes everybody knows everything that the folks in this room would appreciate and work hard on every single day. And that, that would really be a presumption that's unfair to the people and unfair to education reform, ultimately unfair to our, our um, most important consumers, the children in the schools. So we like to really do a series of knowledge questions as well as opinion questions, just to understand what people know and believe and, uh, and think about different aspects of education reform. So for the 20th anniversary, Jeannie and CER commissioned a poll. We really tried to look at sort of the legacy of education reform over the last couple of decades and also use that as a starting point for the next 20 years plus. Um, what is the legacy on which we can build? What part of that should be the vision for the future? And what part of that truly look like accomplishments? And, and you know, of course, due in no small part to the efforts of our folks in the states, what really has been transformative and made a difference in the classroom. There are summaries for everyone. Um, I was a pollster, then a lawyer, then a pollster again, so we actually did a 30-page report because we can't <laughs> stop typing. And Stephen Spiker, who was very helpful on this whole effort from the polling company is here as well. Thank you, Stephen. So the entire report exists. I'm sure it can be sent to you. But um, in terms of just giving you some of the highlights, it's, it's not a new finding that Americans, that parents think they should have more power over where their children go to school and what is taught there. But it is quite remarkable that the high numbers for this appetite for accountability and innovation coexisting at the same time have never been higher. And it's also true that people who don't have children in the current school system share those views. And I think that is some, one of the most important takeaways now. We in this country demographically have fewer people having fewer children than ever in our nation's history. And yet you see in this poll that non-parents often mirror the feelings and the depths of feelings of parents because they look at themselves as stakeholders in the educational reform process. Not just because they own property, not just because they pay taxes, but because education is a core governing value. Quality education is a core governing value. One need not to have a child in the classroom or in the school system or a child at all to feel the impulse that we ought to have good schools. Uh, and so that's, that's a really um, important finding here too that non-parents and parents think almost identically on a number of different reforms. So they want power and they want options. What does that mean? 62% favor performance pay, really to financially reward teachers who are, whose product speaks for itself. And in that way, it just mirrors the private sector. And when I looked at the data that we compared to the 2005 survey eight years ago we did for CER, I, was, I, I looked at it and I thought, wow, the impulse, 62% saying, Performance pay is a great idea. 86% believing that school systems should have the opportunity, the ability to fire a poorly performing teacher. Uh, what a difference a recession and, and a tight job market will make. <laughs> uh, when people are saying out there, wow, you know, I lost my job and I was a great employee. I, didn't, I haven't had a raise in three years. There are no more bonuses. They're about to cut back on our benefits and has nothing to do with my, you know, and, and yet I'm a good performer and I wasn't, not only was I not financially rewarded, I was fired, or I know people were fired for poor, poor performance. In this way, Americans simply want the educational system to mimic the rest of uh, the rest of America, the rest of working America. That they don't think that's a tall order. In addition to sustained support for alternatives in their assigned public schools, the data show an appetite for bringing educators in line, really, with the rest of us. They want more power for parents, more power for the students, but also more power for the teachers. Um, the impulse for blended and digital learning is at an all-time high. People think that you can respect tradition but buck convention and that you can successfully marry traditional basic education uh, teaching along with new technologies. And if you look at the answers to the open-ended question we asked, you know, what is the biggest innovation that you've heard, seen, read, or heard about in education recently? And that's an open-ended question. People could have said whatever they wanted. The number one response are people talking about the integration of technology within the classroom. Not the replacement of, of basic skills and education, but the integration of technology as a tool to help. Choice remains a, ve a very important value. Look, choice is a very important value in America, small c choice. But parent choice and school choice in a list of seven or eight terms that we tested, uh, they're the only ones that achieved over 70%, 74 and 72% support respectively. Why is that? Because school choice and parent choice um, have a rare, occupy rare space in, the, in our culture. 
in that they identify the problem, the solution all at once. They sort of tell you, well, I know what you're talking about. We need better solutions in our educational system, and here's the solution. It's not just talking about the problem, the problem, but actually coming up with that. They think there needs to be greater latitude. Um, also, what's really different now than, than eight years ago is that parents are listening to their children more. They're not doing what other parents are doing. If it's, you know, the, the threshold test for moving your child to a different school or considering doing that is not what the other parents are doing, not even really what the teacher necessarily recommends. It's if the child feels that they cannot keep up with the work or is not being challenged by the work. 71% of Americans said that they believe the parents, not just parents said it, 71% of all Americans, parents and non-parents said, they believe that the child cannot keep up with the work or is not being sufficiently challenged, that it's, it's, it's time to consider an alternative. And frankly, if you look at all the data, you come up with this, this narrative that 100 years from now, this whole idea that you're in the same school district, in the same school line for 12 years or 13 years, um, will seem very antiquated, will seem a relic of the past. Because that those choices, you know, you will make those choices according to the child. I mean, you can go to Starbucks and customize a latte 3,000, well, 12,000 different ways. You certainly should be able to customize your child's education. Um, also, I was really astonished at the poor marks that our state legislators received when asked how are they doing on the issue of education. Most people, two-thirds, gave them a fair or a poor rating on how they're handling the issue of education. I really could not have predicted that, which is why we do the polling. And, uh, and what I learned from this is, with everybody talking about the debate over Common Core and Washington, D.C., and the federal government, it's really easy for our state legislatures to push, point the finger at Washington and blame the big bureaucracy. And Washington, the Department of Education, of course, accounts for 7%, I think, of all uh, school funding. But um, it's easy to point the finger outward, but a lot of your constituents are pointing the finger inward at the state legislatures and saying you're not doing as great a job as you can in education, and why is that? You have a lot of you in this audience to thank for that because so many people are aware in the polling, in a different polling question, that state and local governments are m most in control of education. What is spent there, what is taught there, who is hired there, who is fired there. They recognize that it's a closer to home in your backyard type of construct. And so just shifting the blame to unpopular Washington, unpopular presidents, unpopular congresses does not allow our state legislatures off the hook. And I think that's a very important message in this polling. Also, um, Americans want more access to data. They want more access to the school goals. So sometimes those, those information, that information exists. But they're basically saying, you know, we, we want we want to be more empowered with information about uh, what the curriculum is, what the plans are. Certainly Common Core is a hot debate right now, and Americans know more about it, I think, than we all may suspect. It's one of those words like campaign finance reform. Sounds great if it's just a phrase thrown out there, and then when people find out it's one size fits all, does not take into consideration the individual needs of the child, the student, um, they, they reject it. I know Jeannie wanted me to keep it brief. It's a really long report. For those of you who are flying back somewhere and your plane is delayed, you're welcome to read it. My pleasure. Um, but I think on its 20th anniversary, what this poll really shows is that CER has proven uh, that a focus on choice and accountability, a sustained focus on choice and accountability, and asking Americans what they believe that includes, asking the students what they believe that should include, and taken together all the different stakeholders and the spectrum of responsible actors in our education system. I think that the sustained focus on choice and accountability has had a positive impact on parents, on students, and in fact, even the teachers. Um, I, I think sustaining and expanding and burnishing this legacy and its impact as we move forward means not always looking for the new and improved creative way of saying something, but it's really just doubling down on the efforts and making sure that that many more Americans, that many more stakeholders understand the lexicon and the educational reforms that are in play. Merging technology with traditional learning, engaging the entire spectrum of stakeholders, thoughtfully and optimistically, and presenting facts and figures. That's the key here. It's not just always concepts. It's anecdotes, it's facts and figures, the progress and the promise. Uh, that ultimately increases consumer demand. And frankly, our students deserve nothing less. Thank you. Thank you, Karen. Thank you. It is a great poll. You do need to read it. One of the things I want to tease out a little bit more, so take, pick up your microphone again, 
is, um, is this notion of um, the little, little bit of bad news for the charter folks in the room, right? So we actually asked people, we wanted to get to the heart of, had they, what do they think of their own school or the school in their community, not what they think of everybody else's school. Then we asked them, would they switch their kids if they weren't happy, if they weren't a parent, would they put themselves in that position? And if they did say yes to switching, where would they go? So it turns out the data on that is not very encouraging. And, and it goes to the, speaks to the heart of people do love charter schools. They have a really good positive view of them. But it turns out that's not where their first idea goes when they talk about a choice. Well, it's true. And part of it is because just private schools are better known or better public schools are better known. Um, and, the, and certainly religious schools and magnet schools. And it's also, Jeannie, it's that um, you were standing up here, you were sitting up here well, I was enjoying my lunch and you weren't, talking about how you've mainstreamed educational reform and charters. I think it's an incredibly important point because a lot of what I do as a market researcher is I tell whether it's corporate America, political America, public policy America, you want to take an individual or an issue or a concept that used to be seen as sort of um, fringe or specialty. So I'll use a consumer product like soy as an example, great example. Years ago, if you wanted to find something, if you wanted to find soy or something made with soy, you had to go to a special store or get a doctor's prescription. I mean, it seems so odd now, right? I mean, you had an allergy or you had a certain dietary restriction or a religious objection to whatever you would need to replace with the soy. Now, soy has gone from sort of fringe, you know, specialty to mainstream. But it is not yet mass, mass consumed. There's a difference. Going from fringe to mainstream means that 50% plus one of us has access to it. We see the ads. We see it in a grocery store. Uh, we have printers at work that use soy printing somehow. I'm like, wow, there's a good, I'll, I'll be using that now in my analogy. Um, but it's not yet mass consumed. What does that mean? It, doesn't, it means that 50% plus one of Americans don't seek it out and buy it and rebuy it. Okay, and, make, and incorporate it as part of their daily lives. That's what's going on with charters. Charters has gone, due in no small part to the folks on the stage, not me, in this room, you. Uh, charters has gone from sort of this out there idea, specialty idea, if you will. We had to go seek it out. You had to know somebody who knew something about it in the underground. To a mainstream concept, but it's not yet mass consumed. So most Americans still do not know someone who attends a charter school. And if they're only left reading the mainstream media accounts of charter schools, good luck. So, I mean, so that word of mouth um, communication that most people say they rely upon uh, for all of their education information is just as important for us to have a seven second version, a 70 second version, and a seven minute version of why charters and why educational reform more broadly is the best route for children. I mean, show them the evidence. Show them, you know, walk them in, show them footage of a charter school. Let them talk to the parents. Let them talk to the students who are just incredibly articulate ambassadors for their everyday schooling. But I think part of that is that familiarity in education breeds content, not contempt all the time. And that people say, I, if I had the option, I'd go for something that I'm already more familiar with that's in my area. We need to get from mainstream to mass consumption in the next 20 years. That's great. What did you think of the, um, let me bring you by, both back in, what did you think of the notion that more parents are listening to what their kids think about their kid, their, their school's rigor, whether they're challenged or not? Well, <laughs> kids say the darndest things. <laughs> I mean, I think, I think it's fantastic. Um, it is interesting that for most of my professional life in education, um, the system kind of dominated the conversation. Report cards, they were called report cards in Pennsylvania, were given to the superintendents, not to the parents. So the superintendents could use this information for curricular purposes or whatever. Um, when I came to the Department of Education, we started calling it PDE, the People's Department of Education, because we felt we should be talking and listening to them, the taxpayers and the parents, and the students. I think it's a, a very encouraging thing, because um, what you want to give people most particularly students, I think, is a sense of ownership. These are their schools, their teachers, their lives. And parents need that sense of ownership. And we all know, common sense tells us, when you have a stake in something, you care about it a whole lot more. If you have a sense of ownership, you're going to really pay attention to how well things are going. So I think it's a very encouraging sign. 
We've been talking about that a lot um, at the organizational level and with a lot of you following who bring in students. It was really, it was actually eye-opening for me. You know, I used to actually say, people would say to me when my kids were younger, um, you kids are different today. I said, no, they're not different. They should act just like I had to act. Oh, I'm not going to treat them any differently. Um, one of mine is in the room. I'm not going to actually hope he's not listening. They are different. They're different. They learn differently. They approach things differently. I was wrong. Right? And this just shows it. But the fact of the matter is, what was fascinating is, in previous polls, it has been, as you said, you know, because someone else is moving them because we read something. Now it's like, how much more likely would you be to move your child if they weren't challenged? Very likely. And kids are, in fact, coming home and saying, I'm not challenged, I'm bored, I don't have this, I'm not learning the right way. And I think bringing them in the conversation may go a long way to breeding that, not just familiarity, but but support and switching. And Jeannie, absolutely. And what we should, what I should mention, I've got the, the charts here. Um, since we're in politically charged Washington, that concept of considering moving a child because, quote, the child expresses an interest in changing schools because he or she is not challenged, 71% overall, but it had what we called tripartisan support. 66% of Democrats, 64% of Independents, and 72% of Republicans all saying that. I mean, this is a message for everyone. They're all, everything, everybody looks at everything as a pitched political battle. Americans don't look at education that way at its, at its base level. And you find much, you know, you find good tripartisan support for all of these concepts, including being able to fire a poorly paying, you know, poorly performing teacher, and frankly, listening to the child. Okay, so here's the other really cool thing that I was actually jumping in our conference room about when we first got the poll results. Because I've had this discussion with some people in this room and elsewhere where many of you will say, parents aren't choosing for the right reasons, right? So we really can't trust them, so we'll build our great school, but really at the end of the day, that's not where they're choosing. Guess what it turns out? They're much more focused on academics and standards and accountability that we're all giving them credit for. So yeah, they might complain when we're trying to close one of their schools, but that is the minority of anecdotes when you look at this data. Granted, it's one survey, but we've seen this anecdotally for years that it's only a handful of people that scream and yell and jump up and down when you're trying to close a bad school. And it's the vocal, it's that parent who stood up at Ed Nation the other day, right, and called, uh, called Joel Klein, Chester Klein, and said, you know, you're taking over the schools and you don't listen to us. Well, frankly, if you try to close this school, it could be it, it could be so bad that kids weren't showing up. He would defend it because it was his public school, right? There's, that's a minority, a very vocal minority. So that was encouraging that there really is this seed. We've seeded parents and the public, thanks in large part to you guys, with accountability, with standards. So what do we do with that next? How do we, how do we go forth? Let's say we have this data. You guys are in, the, in, the, in the, the whole reform world still in many different ways, and you were superintendents. How do we collectively take this great data and do something with it to make things better? Well, one of the things you do is what you're doing, right? You just start to disseminate it, and it, it hasn't changed a lot as, as to whether parents wanted the information or not, but I do think that's really valuable information, that this is the basis on which we make this choice. Like, we really are looking for excellence. I think that's absolutely pivotal. Um, and I think the transparency gets easier and easier. So I'm a big great schools uh, fan, greatschools.org, that website. I like their one through 10 rating. I always compare it to what the state is doing. I think it's fascinating. Um, when grade schools now comes out into communities and they put out the chooser, the, the one in, that's printed and they do it in DC and parents are carrying it around. I, I think things like that are really important and there are a number of organizations that are rating schools you know, in their own way, but at the core of the foundations of that is how are they performing academically plus, right? Plus is important. What are the graduation rates? What are the competencies of the teachers, et cetera? So you don't have to buy into necessarily one size fits all. There's actually a marketplace of information out there about how your school is doing, and you have to put your feet in the school, right? You have to walk into the school and see what it feels like to you. So I think parents understand that much more now, actually because they have to and because these choices are out there. And they have children who, frankly, when, you know, in the early days when I was raising my kids, I could tell them things that weren't necessarily true and they didn't have a phone in their hand to go, wait, uh-uh, uh-uh, which is what they do now. It's what my grandson does to me now. So there's no lying to the 11-year-old. Like the 22-year-old, yeah, I told her all sorts of stuff that wasn't true. I just didn't have time. Um, but these are kids, as you say, who have evolved in a, in a world where they get their answers right away, they expect it, they know they ought to know, they're different. They're different because the world is different. I think another thing you do is make sure that this information gets out very broadly because 
I think a lot of people think the way they think about these things is not the majority view. Uh, they, they need that support network that we had. They need that sense that they're not weird because they're listening to their kids or they're concerned about the quality of the schools. That basically common sense still does matter in this business. A lot of this is common sense. Being able to evaluate the quality of a teacher's performance, to be able to look at quality of education, these are common sense issues. They're also very American issues. I mean, it really is American apple pie. So I think what people need to understand is that, yeah, it's all right to think this way because most people think this way. And that's what legislators need to start hearing because as always, they will react to the majority view as long as it's presented in a way that is compelling. That's really great. Kellyanne, any last thoughts about the poll? Yeah, one thing I would say, I started out talking about the difference between public opinion, which means you have a set of knowledge and you're weighing different options and consequences and making a choice, and that's your opinion. Chinese versus uh, pizza tonight, olive oil versus balsamic, you're making a choice. That's an opinion. But that means that you have a base of knowledge. And so the knowledge questions are really important. Most Americans still don't know that charter schools are public schools. And so let's begin with the basics here. So when we describe in the poll, you know, do you support or oppose allowing communities to create new public schools called charter schools that would be held accountable for student results and would be required to meet the same academic standards and testing requirements as other public schools but not cost taxpayers any additional money? We don't even say in there it costs less. We just say not cost taxpayers any additional money. We're not talking about the better test scores. We're not talking about the one million people on the waiting list. We're not puffing it up with all these facts and figures that would have been legitimate. We're basically just asking about the concept. That's 73% support, 90% opposition. Higher support among minority populations. Um, higher support among men, actually, in 25 to 34 year olds that age group that's having the small children or planning to. And that's where I want to end here, Jeannie, because I want to say something I couldn't have said 20 years ago. Um, we talked about the, the, the increase in sort of non-parents in America, people who through either choice or circumstance are not having children, and that's one of the largest explosive aspects of our demography in addition to what we all know about um, different uh, the Hispanics and the Asian populations growing. But I want to put something else out there. We should be talking not just to parents and school-age children parents and grandparents. We should be talking to what we at my firm call the not yet parents. These are people roughly between the ages of 25 and 42 who do not have children. They are largely married, but some of them are unmarried. And what binds them together is that they do not yet have children, but they fully plan, expect, and want to in the next one to five years. So all of a sudden, they look at the world differently. They start to say, you know, we love living around here because we like the coffee bars and the sushi and the wine and the convenience, but I don't know anything about the schools. I grew up a thousand miles from here. Um, you know, they start to worry about safety and schooling and all these things through the prism of a child who's not yet with us. And that is, go look at, go look at modern advertising. It's all about planning your family. People plan to the second now when they're going to have children. And that's for another debate, but it's a fact. And, and, and may I just say that we ought to be talking to folks who are not yet in the system. There's too much linear movement here. Let's talk to people and put them in a box based on who they are now, their gender, their age, their race. Let's talk to people in terms of their immediate plans, immediate future plans. They're not yet in the system and they are eminently gettable. They want what's best for their children. They're registering at Babies Are Us and they're painting the nursery, they're doing all these things. They are inundated with choices every day. They're looking for somebody to edit their choices. They have so many choices. And then boom, they get to the public education system and they say, where are all the choices? Let's get to the not yet parents. And that's one thing I would just leave to sort of segue between the first 20 years and the next 20. Thank you, Kellyanne. Thank you, Education Leaders Council, friends, allies. Thank you for watching.